Hi. She joins me in Studio Q. How are you? I'm good. Glad to be here. Well, thanks for uh, joining us and talking with us. You're an artist who's worked in several mediums. So what did writing a novel feel like? Uh, well, I thought it was going to feel a lot like writing a short story, mm -hmm. which that experience for me is sort of like an act of passion. And I have an idea and I write it really quickly and I don't revise it much. Um, which means I think it's pretty good, you know, mm. from the get go. Whereas writing a, a novel, I was just like in this no man's land for months writing the first draft. Uh, cause I had the idea, you know, I knew, I knew the story. So I was able to you know, force myself like the to narrative arc, it. like front to back, sort of. Yeah, not any secondary characters, but just like these two main women. I knew, I knew mostly their arc enough to push through a, a draft, and it was just that part was so hard because the writing was so bad, and I was like, "What? Like, oh, I guess I'm one of those short story writers who can't write a novel, but too bad because I already like sold this and." <laughs> There's nothing to do but keep moving forward. And I think what I didn't realize is like, oh, it actually is a different process. Like you are making the raw, it's sort of like you're making the raw footage. And then the next step is you get to edit it. Hmm. Um, and if we're to compare it to movies, you get to edit it and you get to reshoot as much as you want for free. Huh. Um, and, and that was just glorious to me once I got you know, got into the revisions, which was most of the process. I mean, that was like two years. Um, I was just in my cozy little world and, and, and liked it. Yeah. Did having worked in different mediums, did that help you understand that, okay, this is another process and help you not be intimidated by the fact that you're stepping into another process? Uh, I mean, maybe a little bit and that like, I've advised enough other people on like how to just like endure the fear that I was like, okay, well, this is that thing you're always mm -hmm. telling people to do. Just like, just keep going. But no, I mean, when you're in it, you just don't, you don't know that you're ever going to be sitting like at radio Q and, and yeah. being like, ha ha, it all worked out. You know, <laughs> you really don't know that. So yeah, it, until it got, until I f started to feel like I could stand by the writing, it was scary. I'm curious about like creative crossover. Like I heard from one of our producers that at one point um, you were thinking, hmm, is Scarlett Johansson maybe age appropriate to play Klee? Like, is there some crossover in your imagination when you were writing? I think I was coming fresh off having made my last movie, The Future, and it, it, it took a little while to just like calm down and nail myself to the chair and um, yeah, stop expecting there to be some social aspect to this activity. Mm. Uh, and I should say now, like by the time I was done with the book, I was like, it wouldn't be Scarlett Johansson anyways. It would be Jennifer Lawrence at this point. <laughs> um, uh, but no, it will be none of those people. The book is done and, and the fantasy of it being a movie kind of served its purpose, I think. When you move from one medium to another, how much in your mind is this, the issue of proving yourself or that kind of issue? How much does that weigh into your process? I mean, I, actually, I'd say pretty heavily because, I mean, it's like no one really cares, you know? So you, you to, to, like, keep going in this pretty solitary life like you've got to create these big stakes where it's just like, <laughs> you know, you're living and dying by this and, and it's going to be the most humiliating thing if it's not good. And, <laughs> and if you were to ever like see the, the reality, like the tiny percentage of the time people are, even your biggest fans are thinking about you, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> you'd be like, oh, okay, well, why don't I actually just chill out? And Yeah. I mean, that's always been a super liberating thing for me is just the fact that everyone thinks about themselves 99% of the time. So no one's really worrying about me, but you're saying you use that as motivation, kind of right. like I need to make them care or imagine that they care. Yeah, no, totally. I have, um, you know, I think it's even more than just the audience. It's like some very old internalized, like, um, I don't want to say my parents because it feels almost like, you know, God or something, although not, I mean, I wasn't like raised religiously, but like 
someone is watching and I must do a good job. Mm. I must be a good person and this is the way I know how to do it. Um, I want to get into the novel a little bit, if that's okay. Um, yeah. The main character is Cheryl Glickman. Do you say Cheryl or Cheryl in your Cheryl, mind? Okay, Cheryl. Cheryl. Yeah. Um, so you described her psyche as sometimes mine and sometimes something I'm making up. What parts of Cheryl did you draw from yourself? Um, well, you know, she has this kind of um, uh, controlling rigidity that that you can really get away with when you live alone. Um, you know, you've got all your little systems and your like very efficient way of doing things. Um, and uh, I, I think I am like that, even though, unfortunately, I mean, not unfortunately, fortunately, I don't live alone, but unfortunately for my systems, <laughs> I live with people who really don't care yeah. um, about the right way to do things. Um, so it's kind of satisfying to be able to have this character who could be so righteous about her completely ridiculous, like, way of keeping order. And, and she recognizes that this order also you know, should you ever become depressed or like down in the dumps, as I think how she puts it, um, that, that there's this standing between you and just total, yeah. um, just, uh, like peeing in cups, you know, I, I related to that to an embarrassing extent. <laughs> Could you like describe the, that, that rule for us, um, like that system? Right. Yeah. Well, the thing is, yeah, like the, the trick of it is you kind of do all these things, which include like not moving objects from their place, any, you know, being aware that you're going to have to put everything back that you take out. So maybe think twice about moving anything ever in the house. Um, and then if you are moving something, try and do this thing called carpooling, where you like wait until there's another object that needs to go in the same direction. And then yeah. you carry them both together. You know, you wouldn't, you know, you eat right out of the pan. You don't put things in balls. That's like a fancy thing you can do yeah. for a guest. It's an unnecessary step. You can just streamline yeah. the bowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and and all this, you do all this kind of as if you're your own servant. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so you think of yourself as this king who who everything is done for, and then there's this like part of yourself that is sectioned off that's like doing the labor the part of the rationale in that system that i really related to um it, it kind of relates to something else that you've said you said everything i do in my life the furious amount of activity i propel i propel myself into is because at heart i feel completely inert like cheryl and i related to that because that whole system was based on the fact that sometimes you get down in the dumps and your whole life is kind of out of control right and you can kind of preemptively just like basically not do anything or streamline your whole life to this like ridiculous extent right right yeah because you know that if things get really bad you might never move again yeah, yeah. so you have to keep things at a certain level just yeah. for safety yeah that idea of feeling completely inert yeah though is is one i really related to i mean i do things because i'm afraid that i won't do things yeah exactly i know uh i mean I don't know. I just started getting into that in, mm. in therapy, <laughs> to be honest. So I'm like not an expert on that. I'm, a, I'm an expert enough to make a character who's like that, but to not see the ways that, um, it, you know, it's very compulsive. And it means that um, like the idea of pleasure, it, it it's like, well, pleasure is just like preempting you're just trying to avoid this bad thing. You're not trying yeah. to do things that feel good. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing that's so unavoidable about it for me is that it just makes sense. And that's what yeah. I loved about the description of the system because it just, it makes sense. It's, right. Thank uh, you. And so sometimes I wonder if it's laziness or if it's like just rationality. Right. Yeah. No, I don't think, I don't think actually you or I are lazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh. It's a, it's a strange thing. One time I identified it as binge chilling. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I said, I just need yeah. to learn how to chill responsibly. Yeah. Because yeah. I think it comes down to, like, I want peace more than anything else. Some people right. want uh, adventure or excitement. Yeah. And I just want peace. Is that something you relate to, too, and try to yeah. translate through Cheryl? Yeah. Yeah, although I will say, like, my capacity, even though I'm working all the time just to have this clean, empty time in my life, mm -hmm. um, like 
my capacity or appetite for that is actually pretty short. Like I remember the other day I, you know, I have a two year old now. It's really hard to like get that time at all. And, um, I like clean, I, I had it all planned out. I cleaned the whole house. So that was done. And then, um, and then I had it so I could take a nap in the sun, which was mm. like, oh, you know, I've been like dreaming about that for like a year. Um, and, uh, and I, I did it, but, um, I woke up with, with this idea, which, which may be my next movie idea. <laughs> and I, I described all this to my husband later, you know, uh, and he was like, Oh really? So that was that was it? Just one nap and you're good? Like <laughs> on to the next thing? Like that fulfilled the yeah. amount of relaxation you needed um, yeah. to be able to like recharge for the next thing, hmm. which isn't true. No, I mean I would like another nap. <laughs> um, some readers might find Cheryl a frustrating character. She's delusional. She's kind of a doormat, but there's something really charming about her. Uh, how would you characterize her? Yeah, I mean. You know, you sense that maybe she's sort of a pathetic figure from the outside. Um, but the thing is, she has so much pride, almost righteousness in her own her own way. Um, that, th And she's also so misguided. I mean, she, she completely misses so many cues and kind of gets so many things wrong, which enables, like, a lot of the story to happen at all. Um, uh that for me she's she's a fantastic character because I get to have all these kind of perverse things hap happen without having a perverse character at all. Hmm. Is she an anti-hero to you? Um sure. Yeah. I mean I I think so. I I do feel like um like I was always working to to never like hum over humiliate her or anything and that in the end like I really did want her to like um like bloom in a really quiet way just that you had the sense like oh this is a full person like she can love just side sidetracking a little bit on this subject of anti-heroes um you see them a lot nowadays in like television and stuff like that and I'm just curious as to why there aren't any just plain heroes <laughs> anymore like I wonder sometimes if we live in an age where we just don't believe that anymore right. we don't really believe in that story you can't have uh Martin Sheen in the West Wing anymore you yeah. need Kevin Spacey in House of Cards right right what do you yeah, think it's about almost that? not sexy it's not sexy and maybe it's just not believable like, yeah we actually know that that's not true now yeah yeah is that something you reflected on with with Cheryl like the complexity and um in her I'm, story no, I I mean, I don't think any of my characters ever have verged on being, like, just too heroic. I think always the notes I'm getting are, like, is this person likable at all? Like, do we want, you know, do we want to follow them? You know, have you degraded them too much for them to have enough power to, like, carry this story? How do you know when such an odd character is still relatable? I mean... That's a tough thing because also my threshold for her is different than other people's. Mm. And, um, you know, I my first readers of, of the book, and it's kind of early but close to finished stage, were strangers. Like I sought out friends of friends that I didn't know um, and specifically people who weren't like sold on my whole deal you know mm. like kind of people are a little skeptical didn't think like oh Miranda Chai book I'm gonna love it who are just like let's see and the, that was really valuable to me because I just needed like some kind of middle ground barometer and and I was impressed to see that certain things that I thought were you know too over the top actually had some emotional weight like the Kubelko Bondi mm -hmm. there's this whole thing about this kind of Baby, baby, this yeah. baby, migrating soul baby, um, at which I was just like, that is pretty off the wall. But but I realized, I began to realize, like, it's, as long as something has some emotional weight, like, it's it's not irritating, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and and that's uh, that, that was something I was trying to traverse. So, 
Yeah, so strangers were the most helpful because your friends are, you know, they're all messed up and confused <laughs> with their love for you. <laughs> um, okay, so Cheryl, the main character that we've been discussing, she gets a house guest, 20-year-old Clee, who awakens Cheryl's physicality and, and sexual fantasy life. Um, I don't want to give away too much, but violence plays a big role um, in, in her awakening, in Cheryl's awakening. What did you want to say about their relationship and sort of that line between violence and love and lust? Right. I mean, I guess, you know, if you have this very internal character and she also has a, a lump in her throat, um, this like perpetual, really uncomfortable lump in her throat, like it's it's not hard for me to imagine if you're totally alone that um, the feeling of being just like shoved like against the wall really hard as as awful and shocking as that is it there might be something also that it stirs in you like mm. you haven't been touched you haven't had any like oneness with the mind body duality for a long time like uh and 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 notably like it it doesn't become useful to her until she starts fighting back you know yeah um and i could really i mean she's she's actually got so much anger and yeah. and it's and it's just kind of free form like when she's fighting back and she's always losing so it's kind of <laughs> endless the the fighting that she can do it, it it just and 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 it's not violent to the point where people are really ending up injured i you know mm -hmm. there's some careful phrases added yeah, there so you can and like, quite early too so you know that yeah, yeah you don't need to kind of worry about that you can kind of go with it um uh yeah, it it wasn't a it wasn't a great leap for me um, to imagine that. Also, I was super pregnant when I started writing this, so I was already in this like altered physical, physical yeah. state pretty much through the whole book. Um, so I think that did impact the book. Like a lot more physical stuff happened for, um, mm. y you know, because I usually am like not even aware of anything below my neck. <laughs> Um, violence isn't something we're used to seeing you explore in your work. Why now? Um, I mean, you mentioned the yeah. pregnancy and your kind of attachment yeah. to your own physicality. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it is actually something it has, I guess it hasn't been in my work, but it's in my life. I mean, I, uh, um, like people have known me a really long time. Remember like the days when if there was a guy in the mosh pit who I thought wasn't behaving appropriately, I would just punch him, you know, like, <laughs> it's not like I've never like punched someone. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not like it's never been so, part of your yeah, life. Yeah, And I even remember like going back further, having a, a best dear friend. Um, and we weren't even that young. We were like, 13 or 14 and we would talk you know we'd be like chatting like girls and then we'd get up on this bench at school and like chicken fight like trying to knock each other off the bench and I remember really like like hating her in those moments and then we'd do it and then we'd be like haha and we'd sit and chat again and yeah so um I feel like it's it's always just right there uh and and I and when I lose my temper there's a few rare times that I've lost my temper that I have ended up with like not doing anything but like my hands around someone's neck and thinking like whoa okay cross the line there especially because this is a stranger um uh so yeah it's kind of like a secret of mine that only like a few people know that's, that, like... that's interesting that you bring up childhood experiences though because actually the first thing that came to mind when i was reading through that part aside from the surprise yeah. was i was remembering play fighting with my best friend when i was 12 and we would do crazy things. We'd hit each other with chairs. I mean, right. he cut me with a box cutter. I mean, it's, yeah. just, it's crazy, but it was fun and it was liberating of like certain emotions. I mean, right. now if he tried to tackle me, I don't, don't know what I'd do. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, I know we don't have that now anymore. No. And I had an older brother. And yeah, I mean, I have this home. There's a home movie of us where we're we're on the bed. We're fighting. And I'm fully fighting. I'm five years younger than him, so it's ridiculous. I'm fully fighting. And at the same time, my other main goal is to pull down his pajama pants. <laughs> so it's, And he's just, like, trying to keep them up. And I'm, like, slugging him and pulling down his pants. And it's just like, oh, that was really – those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> 
throughout the novel, Cheryl expresses her desire um, for love and for a family um, by seeing her soulmate, as we said, in that, in that baby uh, and in different babies that she meets. Mm-hmm. Um, one reviewer asked whether this is a comment uh, from you on the state of feminism today. Is it? Oh, uh, no. Uh, I feel like I'm rarely commenting on the state of feminism today. I'm, I'm just being a woman and feeling like I have the right to write anything I want. And so maybe that in and of itself is a comment mm. on feminism today. Uh, what about the comment on feelings of isolation and, and loneliness through Cheryl's character? Yeah. What draws she, you to those topics? Well, I mean, that's loneliness is this like very old dear friend of mine that I uh, I would would have thought that, you know, once I was married and had a child and um, had a very full life that that would go away. But it turns out it's something that you kind of vigilantly maintain hmm. like and and are like there's some part of me that's totally blind to like how much connection is is just right there and uh so it's not it's not like something i'm having to like dredge up from my 20s or or something it's i i think uh y- you know those those things are just in the pit of you and you it, it's like my life's work to hmm. to to realize um that I don't have to do that anymore. Like I don't have to be that person. So, so Cheryl's, you know, like a, a shadow version of me. Um, and, and it, and it's, it's nice to be able to play that out in, um, not in a way that's like apologetic, you know, like, Oh, this person clearly needs to be fixed in a million ways. Like she's not thinking that way. And in fact, it, her, all her sort of, ways of thinking become kind of powerful or even kind of procreative. So, um, yeah, so I think Mm -hmm. there was something joyful about that, writing that for me. We're talking to Miranda July about her debut novel, The First Bad Man, and we're on the topic of loneliness um, right now. I've heard someone talk about two different kinds of loneliness, and one is like an essential, I don't want to say essential, fundamental loneliness that we can never get rid of. It's just the fact of we're our own person and nobody else is us, and so we'll never be fully known right? in that way. And then there's another kind of loneliness that is, um, I guess, darker. and Right, more like a depression. M- yeah, more like a depression. Do you see those as two different things? Yeah. Yeah, it, and I think in a way... In the book, like, there's a part where I talk about um, the point where the, it, it, in, like, right after the sperm meets the egg, there's there's a, or there's a point where you go from being, like, two things to mm-hmm. one, and that you're sort of eternally lonely from that point on, um, and, uh, and so that's that first kind of loneliness, I think, and I, I try and like hold that and keep it separate um while you know i think instinctively that cheryl's the kind of person yeah who's uh, avoiding being depressed or has been depressed i do also think there's um there's there's something almost kind of spiritual about that like fundamental aloneness and no one in the book ever knows each other very well yeah, I mean, when you just describe that kind of um, image of two becoming one and then one being one forever, there's something about that that is kind of melancholy, but not depressing. It's right, you know, relatable and true, and yeah, um, it's yeah. like a real. That's uh, like the human plight. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's violence uh, is explored in this novel, also loneliness, isolation, these like heavier topics, and yet a lot of your work is described by reviewers still as quirky. It's not uh, necessarily a term (laughs) that you agree with. Um, How do you feel about that as a descriptor for this book? Right. Well, um, I mean, I feel like in a way people are moving past using that word, especially as applied to women, um, 
at this point, like I, I, I'm beginning to notice like some self-consciousness about you, like even this question, yeah. you know, I feel like you would have just said, and you're quirky, you know, like <laughs> not you personally, you never yeah. would have said that, but, um, uh, so I'm, so I feel like there is a shift generally culturally, people are kind of looking at the adjectives they use for like accomplished women mm -hmm. and, and why, why do, you know, um, and, and why is a word like quirky or whimsical, like somehow diminutizing, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and then I would also say, yeah, like this book is, um, it, 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 for the most part, I, I am getting like, um, feedback. I, I think anytime you get into motherhood, suddenly it's like you get out of quirky jail, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, you did something real <laughs> with your body. And so you get like, you get all these points um, for that. <laughs> um, so along with the book, you've also created an online shop. Oh yeah. Yeah. Where did that idea come from? Um, well, you know, I have all these like art ideas that I'm always sorry. Let me interrupt you for a second because mm. maybe I should give some background on what's sold in the shop. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the online shop sells objects from the story. So like a broken vase, for example, a right. uh, hairbrush with with blonde strands on it. Um, yeah. So now you can go ahead. Where, where did that idea come from? Um, right. I think I was thinking about like an art project um, at the same time that was like I had this idea of like what if I went to someone's house and like sourced all the objects in their house, like rebought them in the world and then put that up for sale. Like, would that be an interesting way to make a portrait of a person? Mm. Um, uh, and then, but you know, clearly I was never going to do that. Um, <laughs> and then I was like, well, how am I going to market this book? I always think marketing is like my job. <laughs> um, and there is actually a department for that that the publisher has. Um, uh, and so that idea of an online store was in my head and I thought, okay, it's, it's not a portrait, but it's interesting to have fictional objects become real and not just real, but things that you can actually buy and own and, in in a very normal way, it's like your eBay bidding. Um, and yeah, and some of them are quite affordable. I mean, it, there's really, it's really random what they're selling for, you know, like a post-it will sell for like $350. Yeah. But then like something that I think of as like really crucial to the story, um, will sell for like $30. So well, I money encourage... is just weird that way. Too, yeah. Right? Money's so weird. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so yeah, you can go to the website and look at money being weird. Yeah. Um, uh, so you, you've written this novel. Will you write another one? Uh, not right now. I mean, my, my inclination is always to work in the medium that I've worked in least recently. So, oh. um, so right now that would be a movie. Um, so I will slowly start writing my next screenplay. Um, and, and I have some other, you know, I always work on a few different things at once. So we're re-releasing or releasing a new version of this app, somebody, um, in a couple months. So that's, yeah, I'm my head is in that. Um, and I understand the show's talked to you about that app. Before, oh yeah, right. right? Yeah, yeah, we did cover that. So just refer to that show, <laughs> click on that link, and go back there. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, I'm doing a performance called New Society in, in a few cities this year. A, a very participatory performance. Um, and eventually, I will write another novel, but. Um, I'll probably come to it as if it's the first time because it will be years from now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Miranda. Yeah, thank you.